we're so lucky as architects, right? We, we actually get to deliver something tangible. People mm. use it at the end of the day. Um, and so we just want to keep doing that. Episode 143. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. I'm your host, Ryan Willard, and this week I'm speaking to Siobhan Reich, who is one of the partners at Farrell's. Now, Siobhan started her career at Farrell's as a part one and is now one of four partners who are delivering the succession plan of the world-famous practice. Um, It's really quite an interesting story because Siobhan goes into a lot of detail about how her career has been nurtured at Farrell's. Um, She talks about the story of becoming a partner and that career path. She talks about the future of Farrell's, how they're moving and changing their brand. They've been for a long time known as a master planning company and actually the work that they do is far reaching into many different project typologies and sectors she talks about the new stewardship she we discuss the connection between the profession and education and Farrell's role in that and how they nurture long-term relationships with team members and how they attract talent we discuss how Farrell win work and organize their marketing strategies and also the importance of site experience for developing a career. So this is quite a rich conversation and we get a lot of insights into the inner workings of one of the UK's most seminal practices. So sit back, relax and enjoy Siobhan Reich. This podcast is produced by Business of Architecture, a leading business consultancy for architects and design professionals. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, Please follow the link in the information. Siobhan, welcome to the Business of Architecture. How are you? I'm very well. Thank you for having me. My pleasure. Well, thank you for inviting me into the office of Farrell's today. Mm. Very excited to be here. Um, you are one of the pa- uh, partners of Farrell's. Yep. You, you've been here since your part one. So when was that, 2008? So 2008, I started as a part one, yes. Fantastic. And yeah. that's, 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 quite a, that's quite a short period of time to go from part one to becoming a partner in one of the sort of premier com- architectural companies in the world. Yeah. I guess, How did you do that? I guess it is. Um, well, how, what, was the, what was the kind of story? If you like? So I, you know, I left Newcastle in 2008 and came and joined here as a part one. Um, did a year's experience here. Um, loved it. Loved the feel. Loved the experience that I got. Went back to Newcastle for part two. Um, joined again in 2011, and I think because I'd been here before, I sort of had the trust a mm. little bit of of, um, of the team. So then I got put onto Lots Road, which was which is one of our big projects due for completion in 2023. We're doing 706 apartments down there. Yeah. Um, and I started with the basement package, um, and then worked up to being project architect on that scheme. Um, within a couple of years and that was a move that was supported by the client on the scheme yeah um so you know I'm thankful to him because he he obviously helped with my progression there um and then in about two, uh, 2016 I sort of started thinking about I'd been working on the project for five years and I was like it's not going to finish for a long time you know is this is this it? Mm. Is this what I keep doing? Um, And one of the people that I worked closely with on the team there um, left and went to another development company. And then we started talking about possibility of roles in development and things like that. Um, We talked about the idea of design director. And I think that got me thinking that there was more out there than just kind of leading the project. But it also then got me thinking about what I wanted to do here at Farrell's. And so yeah. we, we then started having discussions about what my next steps would be. Um, so, the, so the seed was planted of, of kind of expanding upon your uh, role. Sort of expanding thing. upon the role and, and taking a little bit more ownership. I mean, you know, my mum and dad have a family business. So right. I've kind of grown up in that slightly entrepreneurial environment and sort of seeing the level of um, 
you know, control over your life you have when it's your own business, but yeah. also, also the stress that comes with it. But still, that was that was something that I wanted to 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 do. And so we just had some open discussions about how I could take that next step and be a part of building Varrells and taking it forward. So, so, um, so, so how does the role, how would you describe the difference in role between mm-hmm. being a partner versus, say, being an associate or being just a, a, a project architect? Yeah. What are the sort of major differences? So the, the major difference is as a partner, you're an equity partner. So you're an owner in the business. And that's the model that we have here because we're an LLP. Right. So all of our partners... Are, are equity partners they have skin in the game yeah. and what comes with that is a change in mentality from being an employee to being an employer now you know it can't happen overnight mm-hmm. so don't you know that wasn't something that happened immediately and mm. um, my sort of first role as partner I was looking at all of our post planning projects and taking more of a sort of overseeing role on technical delivery and um, I looked at changing things so that design was no longer something that then went through a post box and came out the other side and was delivered. Yeah. So um, I put into place like a lessons learned process so that all of the mistakes we make as we then develop something into being deliverable were fed back through into the planning process and right. um, set up a sort of technical group so that there was sharing of findings across. Because at that point we had sort of seven live construction jobs. So there were actually loads of things that were helpful if all the project architects sat in one room at the same time. Um, and so I started doing that and then my role sort of developed more into um, taking an operational overview um, for the practice. So, it, it, you know, it's very varied. Um, you can be doing anything from HR to marketing to mm. business development to firefighting, yeah. um, you know, finance. Um, and so that's been a real baptism of fire <laughs> over the last five years. And there's been a lot to learn. So, um, so when you become, you start having equity in the business, mm-hmm. how does that work? Is that something that you, that you negotiate? Is it, is it kind of awarded to you or is it kind of on a, on a plan or do you actually invest your own money into the business? To You, you to invest your own money into the business. Well, it's not your own money. It's supported by the bank. It's a professional loan scheme, right? Um, which is what most professional services firms use yep. because often partners don't have yep. that amount of equity just sat there. Yes. Um, and we started all with equal shares. Mm-hmm. Um, and then as part of the succession arrangement, the numbers have moved around just because of different responsibilities that people have taken on. And as Terry's stepping back from the business, more shares have become available. Right. Um, and so, you know, they're now distributed between four members. Um, but the plan is to bring in more members and to distribute those accordingly. But that's something that we kind of hear. We do that by mutual agreement. Right. Okay. Um, so everyone's part part of the democratic decision-making yeah, process where yeah, the partners yeah. kind of come together. And sort of each share has a value. Got and it. so that then re-dis- rebalances the amount of equity that you then have in the business. Yeah. That, that's, in, that's very interesting. I'm, you know, we speak to a lot of architects about how succession planning mm-hmm. is working in the business, how mm-hmm. when kind of chairmen's or CEOs are starting to take that step back and yeah. equity becomes available and how it becomes available to the, the, the kind of existing team members mm-hmm. is always very very interesting yeah and um, what's the kind of succession planning philosophy if you like of Farrell's at the moment so we are moving away from a practice that was all about one person to a practice that's all about the many yeah um, and our succession plan is based around that like we are at a point where we're trying to build the practice as a vehicle for everybody to do what they love and have a mm-hmm. bit of fun with it um but also to to have their input into how they want things to be done, to the kind of work they want to do. So, you know, if there's a real desire, which there has been lately, to do more affordable housing schemes, then that's something that we pick up and then kind of push business development in that direction mm-hmm. so that everybody kind of has a voice. And my ah. hope is as we kind of carry on the journey of succession and have more members around the table, there'll be more voices dictating the future of the, of the company. Mm. Um, How do you know what bits of the company to preserve and which bits to relinquish, if you like? (laughs) Yeah, it's difficult because that, I mean, you know, one of the difficulties of succession is that you're not starting a company from scratch. Yeah. So you're not building your overheads naturally. You're not building your company naturally based on, Mm. you know, your own thoughts and ideas. You've got multiple voices around a table that you've got to reconcile Um, and, you know, some of the things from the legacy are really powerful Others can be a weight around your neck. And yeah. so like 
and um, how we work out how to keep those, I think, trial and error. Mm-hmm. And, and for us uh, here, change, like we just, uh, I like us to never stop changing. So we kind of put something in place, try it out for a little bit. And then as soon as everybody gets comfortable with it, we try something new. Yeah. Um, it, it, you know, that journey dictates then what you need to change. Yeah. Like we've, we've restructured multiple areas of the business in the last you know, five to eight years. So. Well, it, it's, it's but it's a natural journey, if well, that makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's, it's interesting, obviously, the business has got, what, sort of 54 years worth of mm, existence history. Yeah. of history. Yeah, and the brand is so incredibly valuable. So yeah. the brand and the name are probably the most important things for us to preserve. And that way of thinking mm-hmm. that's come with that, um, that ability to, to tell a story, to look at a site uniquely, I think so many architectural practices kind of get hung up on what their design vision is. Yeah. Um, and for us, there really isn't a clear design vision. Um, you'll mm. see that every project is totally different. Um, but I think the best architects respond to each site uniquely, to its brief, to its constraints, to what the community wants and, you know, deliver each project uniquely. Yeah. Um, and so I, I, I think as well like historically we've been known very much as a master planning practice mm-hmm. because that was sort of terry's passion and expertise and he was incredibly good at it um we still do master planning and every project still has an urban thread to it but there is more of a move towards delivering uh, single buildings um just because the sort of staff dynamic that we've got at the moment, we, you know, we have a strong technical team that were built up from delivering those seven projects in the last three years. Um, and they're kind of continuing to do that. Mm. So. Um, going, going back to talking about the role of a partner mm-hmm. at, at, at Farrell's, um, what are some of the things that you, you now do that you weren't doing before, particularly in the areas of say business development? How, how is, how is that role spread amongst the, the partners? So it's not just spread amongst the partners here. It's spread amongst the senior management team right, okay. because we're looking at our future partners. And right. that's something that we've been doing for the last three years now. Um, we're kind of really working on getting their networks built and their profiles built in the industry as well. Um, what's involved in that is, you know, we have a we have a new business software that allows us to manage kind of all of the different deals and opportunities that we've got open Mm -hmm. and and everybody inputs into that. We meet on a weekly basis and we talk about different opportunities. I think business development for us, again, is quite a natural process. We're very lucky in that we have a lot of repeat clients um, that continue to bring us projects. Um, And so, you know, we keep building on that. And then um, we've been working with a marketing agency with Holistic for the last um, couple of years. And they're helping us to build the profiles of each of those individuals. Because obviously, you know, you go from being a practice with a name, Mm -hmm. with Terry Farrell, who's a big name in the industry, has a big voice, to suddenly, who are those voices? Yes. Um, So we've been doing a lot of thought leadership work, um, you know, writing articles about um, I don't know anything from permitted development to reclaiming our streets to like um, the value of volume in retrofit buildings. And so each member of that senior team is then sort of growing their own voice and off the back of that attending conferences, speaking events, lunches, and then they build their network. And so business development happens naturally from that network. Got it. Very clever. And uh, that's, uh, that's really interesting, actually, that the, actually each member of the team has their own sort of summit map, if you like, mm. of where they're going in their, in their careers. I think and it's also just because everybody, voice. like, they have to be interested in what they're talking about. You can't force someone to talk about something they're not passionate about. Yeah. So actually that's kind of how we, how we sort of manage it. And, and, and in terms of having repeat clients, mm. um, you know, what, what, is, what, is, what are we talking to in terms of, like, lifespan of a client typically oh. at Farrell's? Um, I mean... You know, we have clients that have been with us since 2000. Right. Um, and we've done, uh, you know, multiple projects for them. Um, we have clients that will work with us for two years and mm-hmm. then they'll get to the point where they need to expand and use different architects because you can't just keep using the same company. Yeah. Um, but ge- generally, yeah, you know, our, long- our longest standing client relationship is 20 years I'd say the rest of our repeat client relationships are sort of um, five years, eight years, mm-hmm. and and then 
um, fresher. Do, do you, in terms of business development, is there a kind of, you know, if you're looking to move into new sectors, so say, yeah. for example, if you're kind of wanting to move away from master planning, mm-hmm. what's the process there? Is it a question of you've got a comms team in-house? That's kind no, of- we, don't, we don't have a comms team in-house. We, um, we spread the load between us. Um, and, um, so if we, if we're wanting to get into a new sector, that's something that we, so I guess that's where we would use holistic, right. um, as the, as the marketing company. So we would talk to them, we'd say, this is what we're looking to do. We're then a member of like a number of organizations. So like London first and the NLA. So we'll then kind of talk to them on mm-hmm. our quarterly catch ups and say, you know, we're looking at getting into this market. They'll then make sure that we get a platform, a speaking event of the same theme, or they'll work with you to build an event around that. Um, and then it, it will go from there. I think one of the things, it, it, you know, direct business development that we've had to do a lot of recently that we've not done as much of before is public procurement and frameworks. Right. Um, because in order to get into that uh, slightly more social housing market rather than private clients or also to get into um, public sector master planning, so um, local borough, town yeah. centre master plans and even really recently the design code work um we're having to go through the sort of framework and og process and that's been a huge learning curve what, for us what, um, what are some of the things that you've kind of extrapolated from that or had to well change? i think the first yeah. ones that we wrote were the you know they were essays about us right and you then realize that that's not what anybody's interested in right what they want you to do is answer the specific questions and so we're now we spend some process um, up front going through the questions, highlighting what they might want from the answers, and then we kind of build those answers between us. But again, that is something that's shared out across the mm. senior team, depending on who's got capacity. And, and I'm always talking to architects about this idea of moving into new sectors, and it's always yeah. interesting to hear kind of practices that have got a well-established history and of, de- of delivery of extraordinary projects that... You still face obstacles moving very into, difficult. into new sectors. Yeah, it's very difficult to um, shift people's understanding, um, you know, of your legacy, really. Mm. Like people assume you are something. Yeah. And they assume you are something because of your website, because of your past projects, because of the press that's been out there. Mm. And so it's a, it, we've seen it's a very slow process. and We've got to be quite patient with it. Um, but we just keep plugging away and eventually we get one commission in a certain sector and then we kind of build on that commission right um, and sort of focus on then explaining what we've done there and what we've learned to other potential clients that might be interested so, in. so, so when you're moving into a new sector like social housing for example mm-hmm. um and you know obviously in the office you, you've got a lot of in-house expertise like mm-hmm. that run very deep in terms of master planning airports other sorts of projects that you've delivered on mm-hmm. um how do you then go about acquiring new resource or expertise in the, in the new sector or do you find that it's actually resources that you've got existing actually apply really well and now it's a question of yeah. convincing the client of that or? so I, th- I think for us with something like social housing uh, you know over 70 percent of our turnover is in residential yeah. so we've been doing residential for a long time so those skills are built into into the organization every housing scheme that you do has an element of um Social housing has mm. an element of affordable housing. Um, and so there are a lot of lessons we can take from that and, and apply to it. So um, we, we're finding with that that it is just manipulating the skills that we've got in-house. Got it. Um, and building on, and, and, and you know, building on the, on the younger team and the fresher team as they come forward, like everybody has their sort of own ideas of good projects that they've seen or good precedent examples that they've seen. And so you, we start to kind of do that research and build on that and that then influences schemes as they come forward. How do you maintain then the, the kind of company culture, if you like, of the, or, what, or even how do you define what the DNA is of, of Farrell's? Uh, difficult question. Um, I think the company culture is always changing right. and it depends on the people that are here. Um, it's probably one of the hardest things to do is to keep the mm. culture, I think. Um, we try and do it by getting everybody together um, on a weekly basis. So we start uh, on a monthly basis. So we start on a Monday morning and the whole office has a session where we kind of present new work that people have been doing. We share ideas, people share holiday snaps to 
you know, a really beautiful building that Mm -hmm. they've seen or been to or a place that they were blown away by. And so there's like knowledge sharing at at a cross disciplinary level. And then we have social events where we try and get people together. The last 18 months, it's been very hard. Yeah. Um, to kind of keep that culture. Um, but we've been doing what we can. And I think we will, we will see as things start to open up again, what that means. Do, does the business have a, a kind of like a more formalized vision framework, if you like, where you've got kind of comp- core values that, no. that get dis- discussed? No, we don't. We've tried lots of those things. We've done many strategic framework, uh, ex- strategic visioning exercises and kind of uh, really heavy marketing processes and they just um we find that you spend a lot on getting it in place Mm -hmm. and then actually following through on that is difficult and I think it's just maybe because there are so many voices in a practice like this that you've got to keep changing and being flexible and that that vision and those values will change depending on who's here so for for us it's not something that's prescriptive got it Um, it's just kind of uh, it's a natural evolution I guess so, so in terms of having like a, a 25 year vision for the practice, mm. that's kind of left. We don't have one of those. O- open, if you like. It's left open, yeah. So like, uh, you know, we like have had points where we have, so the very sort of early stages of the, of the succession planning um, this time around, which was kind of where we were really looking at changing the dynamic of mm-hmm. ownership and, and sort of moving the um, senior team now forward. <clears throat> we did put a five-year business plan in place right. and that was also something that we had to kind of talk the bank through because you know the they're part of all of this yeah um and um and and so we had that document but again that was quite a loose document and it was more that um it, it was more the sort of processes that we would then put in place um so like we would encourage everybody to do a little bit of business development as well as their project work um that we would um, you know, our hiring process is done by a smaller team mm-hmm. so that there's a consistency in terms of the people that we're bringing in. Yeah. Um, so it, it was more a sort of looser fit of systems rather than a vision Got of where, where the practice will go to. It was almost, almost like a kind of design philosophy, if you like. Yeah, I guess a, so. Yeah, I guess so. It's like a, it's a really loose structure. Yeah. Um, and, you know, there are financial targets that go with that because you need those. Yes. Um, but again, those financial targets are not something that influences the culture of the company. They're yeah. just, they're something that you've got to meet. How, how in terms of the, the kind of like design philosophy, if you like, mm-hmm. is there values that are, that are kind of clearly articulated around yeah. that or is that more fluid as well? So it, again, it's more fluid, but I guess um, for us, the, the sort of big thing is that place is the client. Right. So every site, we always look outside of the red line boundary and make sure that that site is influencing its direct context, Mm. is influencing and learning from its community, that we're looking at the client, what they want, the brief, and that we're delivering in that way. Um, So, uh, you know, that's the kind of very loose design philosophy. Um, And then within that, we offer a service. Yeah. We get planning quickly, normally first time. You know, like we then can deliver technical information. And like, that's what we do as architects. Mm. We're a part of a cog in a wheel and we deliver a service and we're part of a wider team. We collaborate with other people. Um, And so I think for us, having a very fixed design vision would stop the creativity that happens on each project. Yeah. Um, And like also more and more uh, developers and clients and local authorities also have a design vision. Like design is so subjective mm. um, that you want to be able to to listen to that and to be influenced by it. And so, uh, yeah, I think it's more that everything's site specific and it depends on the on the parameters for that site. So what would you say the, the types of clients that you're best at serving are? How would you describe them? <laughs> um, so we're probably best at serving um, clients that have not got years and years of experience. Right. Um, because um, we're not the most corporate outfit. We don't have um, measured, uh, like, you know, gateways or we, we don't have kind of fixed systems and mm-hmm. things like that. So um, I'd say we're, we're, we're better at serving clients that are interested in a partnership. Got it. So a more collaborative yeah. time, type of working style, if you like. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it, it's, it's interesting talking about this kind of, how you reconcile 
the business elements in architecture with the kind of creative culture that architecture kind of sits inside of. And, you know, Farrell's is one of these companies that's kind of appears to have done that very well, where you've kind of still got the creative energies and it's a, it's a large for an architecture firm. It's a large scale it's business. A, it's actually a small scale business. I would say it's not a large business. The brand is much bigger than the business. Right. And that's an interesting perception that everybody has. Um, and I think it kind of comes with the legacy and things like that. But we're a small to medium sized practice. We have, you know, 40 to 50 staff generally. Right. Um, and it's a very personal touch. Yeah. Oh, that's, that, that is very interesting. Yeah. I, was, I thought the company was a lot bigger than that. Exactly. I thought it was about three times the size. Exactly. Wow. Okay. <laughs> what, what, how, why do you think that, that kind of perception exists? Um, I, I think it's a historical perception. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, historically the company has been a lot bigger. Mm-hmm. Um, but for the last 10 years, we've been around the size that we are now. And that's the sort of plan moving forward. Right. Is that we can offer a more personal touch to people um, rather than being that kind of bigger business Got it. than we were previously. So, that, so that's going to come with a, with a culture change in itself. Yeah, I mean, the other thing that's worth mentioning is we're talking about the London studio here. Right. Um, and so that there is an, an other studios in Hong Kong and Shanghai and Australia, and they also have, you know, the same number of staff, if not right. a little bit more. So I guess when you look at the Farrell's brand as a whole, yeah. there probably are the level of people that you're thinking about. Yeah. Um, but I'm just talking about London. Got it. So in, individual, individually, each of these headquarters are kind yeah. of... You know, yeah. much much smaller outfits. Yeah, that's really that's really interesting. Mm-hmm. How do they interact with each other then? Um, so we try and share knowledge. We try and share. Um, we try and share staff if we need to. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, and we kind of collaborate. You know, sometimes there'll be crits on certain projects and things like that. Um, and then we, as a management team, meet monthly to kind of talk about wider issues and understand what projects each people are doing. Got it. Um, and some of those other um, offices in other countries, how do they end up kind of getting formulated or started? Is that always specifically to do with a particular project being delivered there or yeah. again, or is it kind of business development minded where actually? No, you know so they, they, I mean, they've been around for a long time mm-hmm. as well. Um, and each of them generally has started, so has started from a project and then that project being built upon um, to turn into, into something that's more. Um, you know more of a, of its own entity yeah um got it got it yeah um, so in, in terms of hiring then and building mm-hmm. the team and kind of retaining quality staff we were talking earlier that you know obviously your your own career development and you've been yeah. here pretty much from part one all the way through yes yeah, it's, it's the only place i've worked which is <laughs> which is quite which is amazing um yeah. and there's, there's obviously a lot of a lot of depth that comes with that in understanding yeah. one particular yeah. business how do you, you know, how does the, how does Farrell's approach kind of wanting to nurture architects? Mm-hmm. Like, what are the things that you that you do to kind of retain yeah. staff for that kind of period of time? So, I think we, um, the thing I've found quite unique about Farrell's is that you're supported to take on what you think you can take on. Mm. You're kind of not held back just because you have a certain title or you're a certain age or, you know, there there are no. Um, misconceptions of what you can do if, if you can do that and you prove you can do it then that's something you can run with yeah. so I think that kind of ownership and responsibility and um, gives people um you know confidence and commitment to the project that they're on they have their own kind of active relationships on that job that they want to keep going with um and we um you know we work to so all of our part ones that we bring in we then offer them um, holiday placements or a one day a week contract while they're back at university so that they can um, keep some income, but also stay attached to the practice. Um, And then we work on bringing them back into part two roles and supporting them through their part three and and building them into architects from there. Um, And that's always been an important process for us to make sure that we give people the opportunity to come back if they want to, you know, yeah. if they, if they don't and they want to go and experience something different, we're also supportive of that. But, yeah. And um, we do have staff that come back and, and join us for their part two and then stay and train as architects with us. 
And so do you, as a, as a kind of leadership team, look at individuals or work of individuals kind of to help them to determine career paths, if you like? Yeah, or? so I guess um, everybody has a line manager. Right. Probably if we're looking at it like forensically, everybody mm-hmm. has a line manager and that line manager will work with that individual to build their career path. We have annual appraisal systems mm-hmm. where we talk about where they see themselves in 10 years, five years, next year, skills that they need the practice to provide. Um, And they're quite open discussions about everyone's progression. And then those appraisals are something that are discussed between the senior management team so that we can make sure we do what is needed to be done so that people stay and commit to developing their careers with us. And and typically how... Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, (laughs) you know. How how do you typically attract um, the right type of person? Um, I I think it's probably part of the the, the interview process. Like... um, I mean, it's really funny, right? It's probably a gut feel yeah. on like um, personality or like whether you think that person's going to be the right fit. And I think the people that do the interviewing process and the hiring process generally have been with the practice for a while. And so mm-hmm. they sort of understand that. And uh, that's how we do it. In terms of how we attract people, it is, you know, we use um, disease adverts. We put things on LinkedIn. Um Sometimes we use agencies, but we try and avoid that because the cost is so prohibited. Mm-hmm. Um, this year for our part ones, we are working with the LSA, the London School of Architecture. So we're taking some of our part one students three days a week, and then they do their studies two days a week. Um, and so that is sort of, give, you know, it's kind of a new education system, right? So yeah. it's, um, it's giving them the opportunity to work in practice and study at the same time. So hopefully that influences their training. And we're working with the Stephen Lawrence Trust to try and bring in some part one students um, this year from backgrounds that perhaps wouldn't traditionally come to a practice like yeah. this. Because it, it's, it's very difficult to encourage people to apply. Um, you know, we, we find we get the same sort of applicants from the same sort of universities every year. Yeah. Um, and that can be great. But, it, you know, we also want to actively give other people an opportunity. Some, something else that we do is we... Um, we do a lot of work experience in the local schools. Right. So we kind of work with the local schools. People come in and do a week's work experience with us. And, you know, then if they're passionate in it, they can come back and do another week or two weeks or build on that. And actually someone who's here now for the next kind of three months doing a summer placement started through exactly that route. She's done work experience with us over a number of years. She's then gone to university to do part one and she's now doing a summer placement with us in her first year and hopefully we'll build her career from there. Amazing. Which is really cool. That's, yeah. that's, really, that's, that's really exciting yeah. to hear that. Yeah. You, you were talking about um, you would like to, you haven't implemented it yet, but the idea of perhaps apprenticeship schemes might yeah. be on the cards at some point in the future. Yeah, we'd, we'd love to be able to bring um, people in through apprenticeship schemes. Um, I think it's just getting our heads around who's offering that, where they're being offered and, and, and going from there. Yeah. What are your thoughts on the kind of the the craft of being an architect in today's kind of culture, if you like? And is it is it being lost? Is it become more more maybe, complex? Maybe I alluded to it a little bit in the whole thing that I think when we're, we're sort of seen as a cog in a wheel now. Yeah. Um. We offer a service, and and that's what we do. It's changed very much from the era where the practice was founded in, where the architect was sort of the person that had the big ideas and, mm. you know, it gave those across. I think the, the craft of the architect um, and perhaps the architect is like, you know, the master builder and your involvement in a project from start to finish is being lost. Mm-hmm. Practices are seen to have certain specialisms. Architects are hired for different stages. And so you lose that continuity now. Um And I guess we're also seeing more and more that we're sort of having to have a bigger attitude to um, wider topics, you know, rightly, like we need to take a view on climate change because we're delivering buildings that people live in and that people use. And so we have to have an attitude to what that means for the environment. Mm. And we have to consciously think about the things that we're doing within all the limitations there are on that. Yeah. And like a social conscience as well, you know, we have to think about how that building influences the local community, how that workforce or that project affects the local community. Can you put meanwhile uses on it? How can you uh, manage the hoarding? Can you contribute some of the, um, you know, 
economics from that project back into the into the local community so like we're now encouraging everyone to when they go on a site visit or go to a project we want them to spend it have lunch and a coffee in a local business right. and then expense that back and then we can track that we're actually starting to have an influence in some of the areas that we're in and like um it, we're in the church street area here which has got quite an active community of residents and they use the office for their residence meetings right. and sometimes some of our architects attend to kind of give them some guidance on development explaining and translating development and um, helping them with that that's that's really interesting um, and kind of going this question of the craft of the architect yeah. and how Farrell's is very active in, in in kind of helping part ones part twos develop developing their careers yeah. What's the relationship that you, like a, a kind of empowered relationship do you see between practice and education? So I think more professionals should teach in university. Um, like, uh, you know, I think that um, like where academia has its place, there are skills that you need in practice mm. that you, you come out of university and you've got no idea how to do it. Um, I did my part three at the AA and they uniquely give you a case study where you had to write a sort of practice business plan and a fee proposal for a project. Yeah. And like, you know, that was something that you could then, I could then work with people here to, to put that together. But it's very rare you get the opportunity to do that until, you know, you're an associate and you're having to put a fee proposal together for a, mm. for a job kind of thing. So I think there are skills that we don't learn at architecture school. And I think sometimes you come out of architecture school with false expectations of the industry and um, think that you're going to be a, a designer and, you know, <laughs> dictating a building. And it, it's not always the case. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's very interesting. And this is obviously like my own personal experience of, of architecture school. You kind of come out of somewhere like the Bartlett and then there's this sort of like, oh, right. It's not yeah. like that at yeah. all. It's you a, end up drawing a partitions package and yeah, you're like, whoa. Exactly. <laughs> and, 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 you know, doing, doing door schedules and things on the airport. Or, <laughs> I didn't think I'd use Excel this much. <laughs> you're just like, oh, right. I didn't realise this is what the, what the job was about. Yeah. Why didn't they tell me? Mm -hmm. But there's, there's also, you know, particularly in, in terms of people wanting to, to set up their practices, there's this kind of a university, you have a very kind of protect. It's been it's very long as well. Yeah. Obviously, the, the training of an architect goes on for about, you know, five, six years at university when you're kind of incubated and protected mm -hmm. from the profession. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I, I fully agree with having more professionals be teaching <laughs> would be very, very beneficial to students and start bringing value to mm -hmm. also education because there's obviously a lot of contention at the moment of the, you know, the wages that a part one can command. And with, you know, for, for businesses, you know, if they haven't got they haven't got systems in place to be able to cultivate and train mm -hmm. a part one or a part two. Yeah. It's very difficult. Yeah. It's very difficult for them to take somebody, take somebody on. So you've got this kind of bizarre situation where you've got people asking yeah. for, um, you know, a part two with 17 years experience or whatever it yeah. is. To try and yeah. You do get that. Um, which is, which is funny. I mean, we tend to take everybody based on their experience and what they're going to do mm. rather than what qualifications they've got. Cause, um, Especially when you're taking um, students that haven't trained in the UK, they often don't have the title architect, yeah. but they've still got years and years of experience. And so although they can't, can't have the title architect for legal reasons, yeah. they still do exactly the same job. So there shouldn't be any distinction there. How, um, talk, talking about kind of working internationally and working with international team members, mm -hmm. how has Brexit impacted the future of of the business and there hasn't so, been any major changes. So, so, you know, again, we're talking about London today. Right. We work in the UK and we work in London. We don't work internationally from right. here. Right, okay. Um, so, but we do have an international team. Mm -hmm. So we have, so Francesco is based in Italy. Yep. And he has been full-time for the last two years. Okay. Uh, the intention was always that he could travel to London on an ad hoc basis when he was needed, but because of the pandemic, that's been stopped. Yeah. Um, but that was a lifestyle choice for him, but we still wanted him to be a part of the company. Mm -hmm. So we have experiences like that. We've had people working from across Europe at points over the last year, but we um, we don't work on international projects. Everything's UK or London-based from here. 
Okay, so I see. So there hasn't been that much of an impact. Got it. At okay. All. So if you're doing international projects, it's going to go to the exactly which, whichever hub is it nearest. Will be that run, place. It will be run out of the nearest office. Yeah. Got it. Okay. Yeah. But in, in terms of kind of having international team members or mm -hmm. kind of existing, has that impacted it or? Um. So uh, I mean, we haven't seen that impacting us. Yeah. All of our international team members are still with us. Mm -hmm. Um. And I, I guess you know maybe one example is that we're sort of. Uh, as I say with Francesco, we're having to accommodate remote working environments so that people can still be with the organisation, but but perhaps not be based fully in the UK. Got it. Got it. Um, let's talk a little bit about kind of finances and mm. the sort of money side of architecture. Mm. Um, and when you came into being in, into your partner role, mm. how did your relationship with the money of the business start to change or how did your understanding start to change yeah you, you have to fully understand it so suddenly your 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 role is in um you know keeping the doors open running a viable business that allows mm. the design and the projects to happen so it becomes part of your part of your every day you live and breathe it <laughs> yeah well what sorts of things or metrics are are the leadership team interested in is it kind of like do you, do you set yourself Profit margins and targets and yeah, loosely we set kind of you know net profit and gross profit targets each year. We um, set a budget at the beginning of each year and we then work to that budget. We review it on a monthly basis. We can see where it's moving, where it isn't. But it's very difficult, like projects, and especially in the last couple of years, mm. projects just haven't happened as you would have thought they would. Um, there are things that are still sat there waiting to turn into a live job that have perhaps been sat there for two years now. Yeah. Um, so you, you've got to be quite fluid and flexible there. Um, but we do we do set those targets and, and review them. Um, we have a, an accounts team that um, provide that information. And we use a piece of software on a job basis. We use a piece of software called Rapport3, right. um, which allows the project lead level, well, it allows everyone to um, interact more directly with the project finances as well. So they will be able to see how much time has been spent on a job each month, how much has been invoiced, and therefore month by month, what your live profit and loss is on each job. Okay. And, you know, each job will have its different targets. Some we know are loss leaders. Some we know will make slightly more of a profit on it. Yeah. And that, again, is kind of a gut feel on each job. Um, and I guess something that comes from the fact that most of the management team here has been here for more than 10, 15 years. Got it. So, so they, kind of, they kind of know when a project's yeah. dipping and when, and yeah. when it's a kind yeah. of long-term yeah strategic play but that know. it's 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 again like yes it's something you have to understand as a partner because you're running a business but again that's a conversation that we're trying to spread out more widely so that people understand why they can't always have the resources that they they want or why we try and push them to think a bit more creatively about mm. how they might deliver something or why you don't need to deliver four options you only need to do two yes you, you know like there's a and, and, and so i think with that kind of wider commercial acumen for everyone yes and um, they start to understand how that impacts their day-to-day -day a bit more as well how, how transparent are you as a leadership team with, with the kind of details of the finances to the rest of the rest of the business in the team yeah we're quite transparent so they they can you know, and you, you would discuss them with them and they'll have a good understanding of how their actions are impacting bottom line yeah, essentially generally yeah yeah and uh, definitely within the senior management team everybody is incredibly well versed in it and they know exactly what moves they're making and how that impacts the business excellent um obviously the business has been has got a long legacy mm -hmm. um 54 years you were saying so that means that you've you've weathered a number of recessions how how <laughs> how has the business weathered each recession mm -hmm. and does, it, is, does the strategies change each time or yeah, what? Yeah, I mean, look, you know, I can't talk, I can't speak for all of them because I haven't got personal experience yeah. there. Um, but you have, I think it comes back to that whole idea of change and never stopping changing. Mm. Like we have to, you know, you know, you've just got to keep hustling um, <laughs> and like keep adapting yourself to the climate and the, and the context that's there. I guess generally, I, you know, ideally you want to have a few banker projects, longer term projects that provide you with that kind of baseline security. Yeah. Um, and, and that's kind of one of the unique and lucky things about architecture. You can be appointed on a job that's going to take five years on site. Mm -hmm. And so those types of things give you that kind of baseline comfort Yeah. Um, so that you can then be a bit more exploratory with some of the other work that comes in. 
but uh, uh, yeah we just we have to just kind of be quite flexible has has the business ever explored other types of business models or other income streams no we haven't interestingly um like you know we talk about it sometimes but not really um like we kind of we do have um model making and cgi services um that are part of the in-house team yeah um and we were always thinking about how we can maybe monetize that a little bit more whether we could share them with other practices Mm -hmm. because like actually it's so difficult for a practice to have those things full time in the infrastructure maybe there are small practices that want to use it and so you know maybe there's a platform there or something but um but the whole kind of like architect as developer and things like that that's not something we've got into no yeah we we just tend to i don't know do a different scale of do a different scale of project or um probably the least architecture income side of things that we do is we do a bit of visioning work for people so um you know we could produce a vision for a town or a Got it. Um, vision for a great estate or something like that um, and that's maybe the most diverse income stream got it great um what's next what's next obviously we've, we're kind of coming out of the mm. hopefully we're coming out of yeah. pandemic measures so, we'll see what yeah. happens yeah so end end of the month we will move to a hybrid working model which right. we're really excited about um so we will people will have to come into the office for 50 percent of their week okay. as a minimum and then other than that it's up to them because there's we've seen some real benefits of people working from home but also the creativity is much harder um mm. and so we're looking forward to getting people back into the office um so we'll do that and you know we've got we've got some kind of new projects starting we're starting some design code work um we continue to to deliver lots road like we've got some new kind of residential projects that we're gonna will kind of be coming into the public domain as they go into planning and we just con- continue to to do some you know to do every project to the best of our ability and I, I think, you know, we, we like to, I guess, we want to make parts of the city that people, we're so lucky as architects, right? We, we actually get to deliver something tangible. People mm-hmm. use it at the end of the day. Um, and so we just want to keep doing that, Love making it. new parts of London. Brilliant. Mm-hmm. And anything specific for you in terms of like career and, and leadership? <laughs> um, well, I'm about to have my second child in January. <laughs> so I think I'll uh, probably just slow down on the leadership for a little bit. Um, one, one thing I, I, I think for me, like, you know, I, I love doing what I do here. I think, as I said, the next step is to build that leadership team and, and make sure there's more of a variety of voices there. Um, but also for me individually, I, I have a role um, with the old Oak and Park Royal Development Company um, that I've been doing for the last three years now. Mm. Um, but that is the sort of board position in a public company. And I found that really fascinating because it's opened my eyes to how, um, you know, how um, development happens at a kind of, at a borough level, really, yeah. um, and how the public sector works. And so I'd like to kind of continue to have those um alternative positions as well because i think that influences then what you think about private practice and, yeah. and how you do things from there brilliant well, that's the perfect place for us to conclude yeah. the conversation Good. so thank you very much for your <laughs> time this morning and then um, having me visit and it's been absolutely fascinating to hear behind the scenes good well thanks thanks for doing my first podcast with me Fantastic. <laughs> it was uh, it was a really nice experience brilliant thank, thank you, you. And that's a wrap. And don't forget, if you want to access your free training to learn how to structure your firm or practice for freedom, fulfillment and profit, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you'd like to speak to one of our advisors directly, follow the link in the information. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.